I don't know if you've heard the famous fable uh, where a hunter comes upon a baby leopard and the, the, the mother of that cub had died. And so the, it was so cute and so soft and helpless that he took it home for, as a pet for his children. And as the story go, goes, the leopard grew and becoming bigger and stronger until one day it attacked and killed the hunter who had reared him. The lesson to this fable is very obvious, and that is that sin is easier to deal with before it, it grows and becomes a habit ingrained and destructive. Uh, but there is kind of a, a, another thought that I wanna give you as well, of course, and that is that there really isn't any stage of development at which sin can be said to be harmless, right? Because even small sins are symptoms of the true condition of our heart. And so in this workshop, we're going to consider how to identify and confront the sins that we tolerate, sins that we deem as harmless. And to kind of kick that off, I want to think a little bit about what has happened to the terminology that we use. What has happened to the word sin? In a book that I use in my year-round mentoring group every year, the book is called Respectable Sins, and it's by Jerry Bridges. And I've used some of his book here uh, but one of the things that he quotes in his book is a quote from Carl Menninger, a famous psychiatrist. And here's the quote. He says this, uh, the very word sin, which has seemed to be disappearing. It was once a proud word. It was once a strong word, an ominous and serious word. But the word sin went away. It has almost disappeared, the word along with the notion of sin. Why? Doesn't anyone sin anymore? Doesn't anyone believe in sin? End quote. That's the end of his quote. Well, he's not the only author who has expressed this question. C.S. Lewis has said, uh, the, the barrier I have met is the total absence from the minds of my audience of any sense of sin. And from our own century, the New Testament scholar D.A. Carson commented that the most frustrating aspect of doing evangelism in universities is the fact that students generally have no idea of sin. And he said, they know how to sin well enough, but they have no idea of what constitutes sin. Well, what about Christians, though? What about our conservative evangelical churches? Do we seem to deflect our own sins of pride or envy or bitterness or even lust while condemning those with such obvious sins as abortion or, sorry, as abortion or possibly even homosexuality or murder or the notorious crimes of politicians and high-level corporate executives? We find it easy to forget the lesson from Luke 18, 13, where the Pharisee thanked God that he was not like other sinners, but the tax collector prayed, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Overall, I think our society has softened the words for sin. Uh, we use the word adultery. Uh, we don't use the word adultery. We use the word affair. That affair sounds a little different than adultery. Stealing is kind of sometimes called fraud. Uh, homosexuality is called an alternative lifestyle, right? Abortion is terminating a pregnancy. Gossip can sometimes be disguised as sharing a prayer concern about someone. And often lying is just renamed coloring the truth a little. But we know that, of course, Jesus emphasized the seriousness of the sins of the mind, not just the outward sins. Um, we can all look pretty good on the outside by keeping our inward sins to ourselves and still tolerate wrong thoughts like jealousy or critical thoughts or negativity or even malice. Uh, so the, the phrase tolerable sin or harmless sin really is an oxymoron. 
It's two words that really don't belong together in a cohesive thought, like jumbo shrimp. Uh, you know, they don't, how can there be a jumbo that's also a shrimp? Uh, does the word shrimp for you mean little? For us in English, shrimp means like a shrimp, a shrimpy person would be a really little person. <laughs> so that would be an oxymoron in English. Um, one indicator that our natural thoughts about sin don't fit with Jesus has come in the Sermon on the Mount, right? The Sermon on the Mount where he would say over and over again, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And of course, he gives the example about murder versus anger against a brother or sister. He told them if they come to give their gift at the altar, but remembered their difficulty with their 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 brother to go and be reconciled first. And a second example he gives was uh, adultery versus looking lustfully at a woman. In Jesus' thinking, they were one and the same sin in Matthew 5, 27 and 8. Instead, Jesus tells us that we're to be different from the world and have thinking that's different from the world. And again and again from the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are. We are what? What are we? We are the salt of the earth. <clears throat> salt of the earth that's meant to be purified and be a purifying influence on the world around us. We're the light of the world that is to shine before others so that the world will see our good deeds and glorify God. Happens only as we recognize the sin in our lives and confront it as sin. So this, this, I really wanted to look at the five different words that the New Testament uses for sin. I didn't even know till I studied this that there are five different words in the New Testament for sin. The first of these is anomia, which means lawlessness. Anomia is a very strong word, and it refers to a behavior that's seriously gone off the rails. And I think it might, be the, it might be the word that's used for the sin of murder, perhaps. Another Greek word from the New Testament for sin is parabasis, which means to cross the line. I commit a parabasis when I've been warned by people who love me very much not to talk politics. And then I go ahead anyway, and within minutes, people are after each other, you know, in each other's faces. I've crossed a line, right? That's the parabasis. Paraptoma is a bit different. It doesn't mean charging across a clear line, but it means slipping across, a slipping, essentially fooling myself into thinking that I'm still good. I can fool myself readily that my wrong thoughts of resentment or frustration are my husband's fault and not mine. A fourth word for sin, hamartia, comes from the world of archery. And I think it's the word that we probably use the most often. It means missing the mark. And this is, this is a sin that is not accidental, but it's on purpose. This would be like a student cheating on a math test taken online by using a calculator instead of showing his or her work and doing it properly. This is a word that earlier generations translated as trespass. What is trespassing? Trespass is to walk in a place where I know I've been forbidden to walk. Modern translations render, render hamartia as sin. And then finally, ophil lema, uh, the word that Jesus uses in Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. This is the word where we say, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. Or some translations say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And some translations even say sin. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Uh, but it comes. this word comes from the, the world of commerce and it connotes an unpay, unpaid debt. This is when I owe something, but I fail to pay it off. You know, I really liked looking at all of these categories of sins, and I could think of my own past and present 
at, that could fit into nearly all of these categories. And, uh, but for our topic today, I'd really like to think about um, which of these would fit the category of what we call harmless sins. Uh, probably paraptoma, because that's the slipping across the boundary and we aren't really recognizing that sin, that our sin as sin. But also hamartia, the missing the mark, uh, which may be on purpose, but is often rationalized as no big deal. Um, and so I, I go back to that uh, illustration of a student, uh, because a lot of the students during COVID that were at home uh, ha had to do their schoolwork on um, some kind of a Zoom account or something of that nature. And so they could be looking into the screen and they could, be a, they could appear to be doing what they're supposed to be doing while half of the screen has something else on it with a game uh, or something of that nature. And so, you know, they do, would do this so they don't get caught uh, when they're supposed to be doing, supposed to be paying attention to the teacher or, or maybe taking that math test, uh, math test, and instead of doing the problems uh, uh, properly to get the answer, they're using a calculator uh, to get the answer. And I heard about one such case uh, where there was a student who did that, who took the test this was a kid who really knew how to do the problems. And for him to work them all out, you know, carefully to get the answer just felt like a waste of time. And so he was doing them with a calculator to get the answers done quickly so he could move on to something else he'd rather do. And when asked why he did this or why he thought he could get away with it, he said, I already already know how to do all those problems. It was a waste of time. And he didn't think you know, that that was something that was a problem until he was confronted. And of course, at that point, you know, he had to make apologies and confessions and, and, uh, and make it right. But my point in saying this is that sometimes our actions stem not from the failure to achieve, but they stem from that inner urge to fulfill our own desires. As James 1.14 says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We gossip or lust because of the sinful pleasure we get out of it, whether it's impatience, irritability, selfishness or pride, judgmentalism, envy or jealousy. And so at that moment, the lure of the momentary pleasure is stronger than the desire to please God. That's what it always is when we sin. It's that we have the, the momentary pleasure that rules over the desire to please God. Um, at the Apostle John wrote this. He said, sin is lawlessness. That's that word hamartia, lawlessness. 1 John 3, 4, and all sin, even sin that seems so minor in our eyes, is in a sense a type of lawlessness. It's not just the breaking of a single command. It's a complete disregard for God's moral will in favor of fulfilling one's own desires. So clearly and ultimately, we all sin in multiple ways every day, and we often don't even understand our spiritual indebtedness to God. Day after day, we've all wounded the heart of God at the level of our thoughts, our motives, and sometimes our words and actions as well. So I'll give you a principle here. I, I like to use principles when I teach. A principle is a truth, something that's true for all people at all times. So this principle is even believers wound the heart of God at the level of our thoughts, motives, words, and actions. I think of my own son when he was a little toddler and I was busy in the kitchen when right next to me, my son appeared. He was holding a house plant with the dirt falling off the bottom of it, and he had dirt all the way around his mouth, which, you know, I knew something had, shouldn't have happened there. And I said, David, did you pull that plant out of the pot? He said, no. He shook his head, no. I think this is a picture of us before God sometimes, when we sin in the ways 
that we just think are no big deal. We, we don't admit it. We don't deny it as sin. We presume on God's grace by tolerating in ourselves the very sins that are so obvious to God. He's right there watching us pull up the plant. And he's disappointed in us when we say to ourselves, no big deal. No big deal. So a question for you today, do you ever overestimate your goodness and underestimate your capacity to sin? Have you ever wondered why you don't recognize his presence with you or um, you don't attribute to the possibility of unconfessed sin? Uh, perhaps you're like me and there have been times when you are having your prayer time or your quiet time, you're in the word of God and you just don't have the sense that you're really hearing from God or the sense that you're in the presence of God. I, I think this, it, if we're human, we've dealt with that. But when I feel that way, when I recognize it, I, I have to stop myself and say, Lord, is there something I have not yet confessed? Is there something that is causing this sense of estrangement? And we have to learn to be sensitive to that. And I'm sure that's something all of you are doing. Well, faith never matures us past our need to depend on God's mercy and stay on guard against sin. The spiritually mature maintain a healthy distrust of their sinful desires. Um, Paul often called himself uh, in his earlier days as a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent of Christ. Wow. But even in his later days, as a mature and wise believer, he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost, in 1 Timothy. And um, John Newton said this once, although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. I like looking at both of these because both of them spoke of themselves as sinners in the present tense. Not I was, but I am. I am a great sinner. Uh, the quote I think is the most illustrative of these comes from the master wordsmith C.S. Lewis. And he said this, this is just a remarkable quote. One essential symptom of the regenerate life is a permanent and permanently horrified perception of one's natural and it seems unalterable corruption. The true Christian's nostril is to be continually attentive to the inner cesspool. Wow, does that just, does that just blow you away that we are to keep our minds so aware of our sin that our inner nostril is aware of the cesspool that is our sin within us. Isn't that a fascinating quote that he would say that? So as believers, we know that Jesus has already paid for our sins, past, present, and future. So why the emphasis on our attention to our sin? We're not establishing the fact of our relationship with Christ. That's already been settled. Instead, we're repairing and restoring our personal experience of God's gracious presence. When I found my daughter at the age of three in our, our bathroom in the front of the mirror using my makeup, and she had ruined a lipstick by rubbing it all the way around her mouth and all over her cheeks, she thought she looked beautiful until I came in and saw her. And of course I said, are you supposed to be fooling around with mama's makeup? And she cheekily replied, yes. You know, she thought she looked so pretty. And she knew and I knew that it wasn't right for her to have done that. But there was a barrier now between us. And the barrier wasn't crossed by sharing the new information. The barrier was crossed when she gave that humble and tearful admission, I'm sorry, mama. And so I want to talk, I want to think a little bit about what it is to have a slow slide into sin. Not, not as that little tiny child, but as the child before God, we as people who have come to Christ, how is it do we slide slowly 
and to sin. How does it happen that the leopard cub, so soft and cute, slowly becomes a dangerous and destructive animal? I'm sure everyone here has read about the world-renowned pastor and speaker and author who, who uh, died a couple of years ago now. And when he, I'm not going to name him, but when he died, women began speaking out about the sexual abuse that had taken place during his lifetime. There had been one woman in years previously that had actually brought his sex, sexual abuse to the attention of his board and they didn't believe her, and she was discredited, and she left the organization. Um, but after his death, there were many other women who spoke out, and to the credit of the organization, they hired an independent company to look into all the allegations, and it was all proved to be true. Um, more and more of the darkness of this man's life came to light, and it has, been, it has entirely discredited him. His family must have been in complete shock and sorrow, and the organization that carried his name is prayerfully trying to figure out what do they do now? How could they possibly move forward with his name at the core of everything they do? And far worse, Christianity and the church carry another filthy blot or stain before the world. Well, what happened? What happened that something like this disqualifying sin could happen to such a godly man, a giant of a man whose books and videos and influence has guided and helped people for decades? Well, it had to have started with something small and insignificant, like a thought. Just a thought, but a thought unchecked can become an escape from the grind, a sense of reward from the hard work. And then the escape becomes a kind of fixation where the person goes to that fixation because it's an escape and a fixation, then fixation becomes a verbal or act, active action and then the action becomes a habit, and the habit becomes a compulsion, all for lack of recognition of the conf and confession of sin. Recognition of the sin and confession of the sin. All of it came out of thinking that it was no big deal at the start, at the very start, at the very smallest point. The rationalization then grew with the level of sin. So the level of sin grew, the rationalization grew. And there's a quote by George MacDonald that says, a man may sink by such slow degrees that long after he is a devil, he may go on being a good churchman, thinking himself a good Christian. We see it, of course, in the fall of King David in scripture, in his life-changing sin with Bathsheba. He wasn't where he should have been. He stayed home from the spring war he glimpsed a young woman, woman bathing. He watched her. He imagined about her. He sent for her. He violated her. And it went on from there, becoming subterfuge, evil strategy, and finally murder. And you know, if at any point David had recognized it as sin and confessed it, if he had stopped himself in the thought and called it what it was, sin, he could have kept from moving through the process, no matter where he stopped himself in the process. And, and his consequences would have been mitigated, and his family would not have been ruined, and his legacy would be more upright. So I want you to consider, in the workplace, on tra public transport, in the gym, daily, maybe seeing the same people, it's, it was just a glance, right? It was just a smile, then it was a word of greeting, then the thoughts remain on that person, not checked, not stopped, then it's a conversation, maybe even still thinking it's all still innocent, but then it becomes imagining with no thought of God's perspective, and it goes from there. 
So another principle I would give you, a great sin starts with a small sin, a sin that seems harmless. And C.S. Lewis has said this, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Disqualifying sin does not occur all at once, out of the blue. It starts with inconsequential steps, indulgences that feel a little bit like rewards or self-indulgence that we have somehow earned. It can be one small wrong step is a, that is allowed unconfessed and unrecognized that leads to another small wrong step and another, and estrangement from God results. And what happens is our hunger for him and his word diminishes. And a critical thought feels right. And personal desires gain strength. And all of one's thinking becomes more self-centered and rationalized as okay. And if this thinking continues unchecked, disqualifying sin can be the result. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. How vigilant we must be against sin. How intentional we must be to allow God to power us for the battle. It's the only way we can hope to make it out unscathed by clinging to Christ. The decisive path out of this quandary is not just a greater resolve to be obedient to God. Such a response is usually motivated by guilt, and the strength of our effort will be directly proportional to the amount of guilt we feel. We'll be right back where we started when the guilt is no longer as strong. Of course, in Luke 11, Jesus tells the story of a man who was rid of a demon who oppressed him. And uh, it sought rest after it left and came back to the man, finding his house swept clean and put in order, but then it took seven more spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. The final condition of that man was worse than it was when he started. Um, as I understand it, that passage speaks of a debilitating sin in that man's life. He was aware of it enough to, to want to purge it from his life. It could have been out of guilt feelings or and maybe by his strength of will he was able to stop the behavior or the thought pattern, but he didn't replace the behavior or the thought with anything else. His house was still empty. So there was a place for the sinfulness to return with a vengeance. The appropriate response must begin with a greater appreciation of the holiness of God and a clear vision of life in God. And it's only along the path of sanctification that the true nature of sin is revealed and its appeal blunted. And I think of a, a really great example. Uh, I had forgotten a meeting one day. This was when everything was on Zoom. I had a Zoom meeting one day and another Zoom meeting with some of the same people the next day. So I missed the Zoom meeting entirely. Just didn't, it just was gone. But I made it to the meeting the second day. And when I came into the meeting, one of the fellows that was in the Zoom meeting the day before that I'd missed said, oh, so you missed the meeting yesterday, but you managed to get to this one. I mean, he just kind of gave me this smart aleck remark, right? Well, I didn't think anything of it. We laughed and we went on with the meeting. But the next day I get this phone call. I get it from this fella who, who was calling me and he said, I really, I just felt terrible after that meeting that I had embarrassed you and, you know, slammed you in front of everybody. And I just wanted to call and apologize. I, I'm so sorry. And I said, oh, I, I'm, you did not need to do that. I didn't worry about that at all. I didn't even think twice. And he said, no, God made me do this. He told me I had to call you and tell you how sorry I am that I did that. And you know, my estimation of that man went up so much. I had such a high estimation of him already, but that just made me think so much 
even better of who he is because he did not allow himself to resist the influence of the Holy Spirit, who was trying to purify him from what he recognized uh, he had done wrong. This is what's called keeping short accounts with God. Keeping short accounts. To keep a short account with God is to keep a softened heart and to let conviction do its work in us because sometimes we're distracted. And when that happens to me, I've come to realize that first, I have to really consider that what the sin might be in my life. If you think about David and the situation in 2 Samuel with Bathsheba and that sin, and Uriah had been killed in battle. If you reading, are reading along in that book, what you see is that David just went right on with life as if it was absolutely normal. He had to have been still going to the temple. He had to still be worshiping. Uh, we don't, we're not told how long it was, but we're told finally that Nathan came to him and said, uh, told him about the man with the sheep, and, and David said, oh, that man must die. And Nathan said, you are the man. Well, it, that's what it took before David was really confronted with his own sin. It took another person coming to him because he had allowed that to just slide by as though everything was okay. He was going through his days as normal. And so if this, is, this is remarkable to me with the, when you see what David has written in the Psalms and you think about the accomplishments of King David and yet he was able to just stuff that sin away and not even think about it, not even when Nathan is giving him the picture of himself as the man with the stealing the man's sheep that only had one, he still didn't even recognize the picture of himself. He had stuffed that sin so far away that he didn't even recognize it. He was going through the motions. He was living his life without conviction and without an active conscience. So God calls us to be on guard, always warning ourselves because on the other side of his boundaries is danger and destruction and death. I know that sounds terribly serious, and it is, isn't it? The word of God is full of warnings and case studies that hold before the reader the bitter harvest of letting conviction bounce off without concern and without confession or repentance. I, distinguishing between confession and repentance, I. Confession, by definition, is agreement with God about our sin. And really, confession is just saying, oh, Lord, I've done it again. I mean, we're confessing when we say, Father, I've, I've sinned again in this, you know, something that we know we do. And that is, our conf that is confession, but repentance is much more. When we sin, God calls us to repent, which is not only to confess sin specifically, and turn, but then to turn from it, to turn from it. And when we turn in repentance from it, turning from it to God, there is always the fruit of repentance that then fills, fills us, his Holy Spirit, and there is fruit in our lives as a result of that repentance as well. So confession cleans out the house, but leaves it empty. Repentance not only cleans out the house, but fills it with the fruit that comes from repentance. There's the sense of the Holy Spirit who comes in and fills us back up. And there is the sense of uh, the fruit that comes out of the life that has lived a life of repentance. Hope I'm saying that the way I wanna say it. It's pleasing to God to see us confess and it's even better when we feel, when we've come, we've turned it from it in total repentance. Well, Bible teachers sometimes teach repentance as having three parts. The first of these is conviction, which is God's work in us. And we can be, we can pray to be sensitive to God's conviction. And I always like to say that conviction from God is a gift. And I, I know being convicted isn't pleasant. We feel guilty. But conviction is a gift because it starts the process. The second part of repentance is contrition. It's the sorrow for our sin. And some people think that that's all they need is if they, they are sorry for their sin, 
that that's all that they need. But for repentance, there's a third step, and this, that is the step of conversion. That's the step of turning away from the sin, and that is what brings the, the fruit into our lives. Um, after 40 chapters of Job, not understanding what God was doing in his life, he finally saw himself in chapter 42, verses 3 through 6, where God asked, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? And Job responded by saying, Surely I spoke of things... Listen for the, listen for the repentance here. He said, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question and you shall answer me. My eyes had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And this is the point where we see Job turning in repentance to emerge into blessing and restoration, the fruit of repentance, the blessing and restoration. I don't know, but when I've read of this about Job and I've thought about the revelation that he had or the little revelation that he had, think about the, how little the, more the revelation they had in the days of Job, if, if scholars are right that he lived at the time of Abraham, but yet he still had such a grasp of who God was and was given such special revelation from God in, to boot, I mean, extra uh, to me, that uh, I am amazed at that, and it makes me think that I want to have that kind of revelation. I want to know so much more about God that helps me to say, along with Job, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And so I give you a, a principle here as well. Only by clinging to Christ May the believer live a life of cleansing and fruitfulness. Now, I want to use myself as an example here, and I will admit to you, sin doesn't always appear sinful to me right away. My sin I'm talking about. Sometimes I'm pretty skilled at refusing the conviction. When I was a teaching leader for Bible Study Fellowship, um, I was... I was uh, in a position where I, I did a leaders meeting for a group of about 70 women every Monday. And then on Tuesday, the, the large group of women would come, which was well into the hundreds. And then I would give a lecture at the end of the morning of discussion of the lecture. So I was preparing a 40-minute a lecture every week as well as preparing the leaders meeting. Well, you can imagine. Only reason I'm telling you about this is because I was immersed in the Word of God Every day, I was immersed in the Word of God. I had to be to, to be able to do it. I was really learning. I didn't go to seminary. I was trained by uh, the, the organization in some measure, but a lot of what I was doing was just reading commentaries and really studying and going, but you know, using all the chain references and reading everything I could find so that I could prepare a, a really good lecture. And, and not only that, not only was I doing that, but when you're doing something like that and you fail a couple of times and you realize that you've done it in your own power or that you've gone into it with a sinful attitude or a resentment, or I began to learn to really keep short accounts with God because I couldn't go do that work if I, didn't, if I, didn't have, if I wasn't getting a clear message from him and if I wasn't feeling, recognizing that he was filling me with his spirit. So during those 22 years where I did that work, um, I, was, I found myself really just dwelling with him, really. And so then I, um, I, I was kicked upstairs to the next position uh, a little higher. I, was, I became an area advisor. And uh, after 22 years, it was hard not to be the one doing the teaching. But now I was, I was visiting other people's classes and I was helping those teaching leaders be better at training leaders and at giving lectures. And my role had completely changed. Well, I was still doing my Bible study. I was still praying. I still recognized the need to confess sin. Uh, but I, I didn't have the same intensity of, of time with, with my Lord. 
that I had had before. I was not as immersed in scripture. I was not as, very, as closely yoked with my Savior and probably not as sensitive to his spirit. I know I wasn't as dependent on him and not as prayerful. So I could do the work I was doing as an advisor without really so much of his leading, his clear leading. Uh, and so here's what happened. I found myself getting kind of negative, negative toward my church and the services there. I felt that I needed to be recognized for my input, you know, and I, that there was a real sense of pride there. I felt that my ideas should be listened to. And um, I began to wonder why I was not as content and not as peace-filled. Uh, but it was over several months as I began this new job, and my attitudes and my thoughts only got worse. So I'm really grateful that God made my wrong thinking and wrong attitudes finally. He, I finally understood what he was saying to me, and it was clear. And as I said earlier, conviction from God is a gift. And I, I, uh, I really had to become more introspective and really analyzing what had changed and then take my wrong thinking to God. So I want to give an application here. When have you recognized sin in your life that did not feel like sin at first? One of the devil's tricks is to present sin as significantly more harmless than it is. In Genesis, you remember when Hagar knew she was pregnant? She began to despise her mistress, Sarah. And so Sarai mistreated Hagar and she fled into the desert and finally began to realize the hopelessness of her situation there. And the Lord spoke to her and told her to go back to her mistress. He promised her blessings concerning the child that was to be born. And he said, for the Lord has heard of your misery. And so wonderingly, she gave this name to the Lord. You are the God who sees me. And her exclamation really captures one of the deepest longings of the human heart. We long to be known. We desire to be seen and understood. But strangely, we fear to be known. And we, the fact that God sees me is equally comforting and alarming. There are things about us that we prefer to hide. But true delight comes when we grasp <clears throat> that the God who sees it all loves us perfectly. Nothing that he knows about you or me causes him to love us any less. So we have a God who sees and hears us. He's concerned for us and for our lives, especially when we're in misery that we've made for ourselves because of our sin. And he calls us to go back into our circumstances and submit, doesn't he? And to thirst for him anew until we can say with the psalmist, as a deer longs for the flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God?